I've gotten a lot of questions over the last year that I've been putting out the market outlook about what all the numbers mean. Uh, what do you mean when you say par rates? Why are we paying attention to this? So uh, this is going to be uh, not a market outlook, but a tutorial on um, what all the numbers mean, why I look at them, uh, where you can find them, and um, you know maybe some interpretation of them. So the first thing that I start with up here are par rates. So I guess I should describe what a par rate is. It is a uh, coupon rate that a U.S. Treasury would have if it traded at par. So if the bond traded at par, we would look at the coupon, and the coupon on the bond is a par rate. Uh, and uh, a curve of all the par rates is called a par curve. That is the yield curve. Whenever you hear the term yield curve, we're talking about the par curve. All of these rates, so for example, let's look at the 10-year over here. Uh, and this is as of February 10th, 3.74%. Uh, By the way, I just do this in a spreadsheet. And I'll show you where you can get all these rates. And this is the rates at the beginning of the year. This was the rates as of last Friday. And then I do a week-on-week -week change. I put last Friday's here. I put this Friday's here whenever I'm if it's I'm doing it on a Saturday, that's what I do. And then all of these cells are just programmed to calculate the change. And this is calculating the change since the beginning of the year versus where we are. Um, but this 3.74 is called a constant maturity yield. What does that mean? Um, at any given time during the day, uh, there may not be a 10-year bond in the market. Now, you may think, but there are lots of 10-year bonds. Well, there were lots of bonds issued originally as a 10-year bond. Maybe there were some issued last year, but that now makes them 9-year bonds. If you find 10-year bo bonds that were issued six months ago, they are 9.5-year bonds. They are not 10-year bonds. The only time there is a true 10-year bond is on the day of issuance, when the uh, Treasury issues new 10-year bonds, that very day, there is a 10-year bond. The very next day, it is not a 10-year bond anymore. It's a 9-year, 364-day bond. You may think, well, one day, big deal. Still, one day of accrued interest is gone. So it is not really a 10-year bond. So uh, how we get these 10-year rates, or how the Treasury puts together these 10-year rates, is it looks for a whole bunch of bonds. If this is the 10-year, we take a timeline, this is the 10-year uh, um, time period here. It'll find bonds on either side. It'll find a whole bunch of bonds. You know, some will be 9-year bonds, 9 and a half, 8-year, 11-month, uh, 11 years, 3 months, because a 20-year bond issued 10 years ago is very close to a 10-year bond. And it'll look at all the yields on here, and it'll use some complex mathematics and say, well, based on how the yields are lining up, if there were a 10-year, this is the yield that it would be trading at. Uh, and it monitors this set of bonds throughout the day because they trade. Uh, they're either on-the-run bonds or off-the-run bonds, depending on when they were issued. They trade all day long. Uh, and uh, based on where they trade, the calculation will keep adjusting what this constant maturity 10-year yield is. So if we can't observe an exact bond, it will calculate a bond. How do we interpret this rate? This is saying that if the Treasury issued a 10-year bond today that had a 3.74% coupon, it would sell for par. In other words, it would sell for 100% of its face value, or if you're used to the 100-point system, we say it sells for 100. Uh, and all of the yields, when you draw them all out, create a curve called the yield curve, which is the par curve. Um, now, you'll notice, if, I mean, if we can do this with a 10-year, why can't we do it with a 9-year, an 8-year, a 7-year, a 6-year? How come there are jumps? How can we go to 3, to 5, to 7, to 10, to 20? Why don't we have a 4? Why don't we have a 6? Why don't we have an 8, 9, 10? It's because the Treasury does not issue a 4-year bond or a 6-year bond or an 8, 9, or 10-year bond. 
it issues a 3, a 5, a 7, a 10. Those are called key rates. And the yield curve plots out the yields for the key rates along the yield curve. Uh, and those yields are meaningful because uh, those are the bonds that are issued in the market. And depending on what you're doing uh, in the fixed income market, you may predominantly uh, invest in the three to seven year. You may invest in the 20 to 30 year. You may predominantly invest in the 10 year, or you may hang out in the money market. Each section of the yield curve has its own specific clientele. So publishing a four-year bond wouldn't mean much to them because there is no four-year bond issued in the market. They can observe a four-year bond uh, uh, that's trading and can see the yield, but it isn't an issued bond. So they are issued for particular key rates. So that's basically what a par curve is. There are really three types of curves that you need to know. There's a par curve. Uh, that is the yield curve. That's pretty much for uh, most retail uh, investors all you need to know. There is a spot curve. That's really only important when you start thinking about discounting individual cash flows. Uh, if you are uh, more into uh, financial analysis, uh, you may uh, in, in, uh, encounter spot curves. And then there's forward curves. Forward curves can be important but it's, it's more of a specialized curve that you probably don't need to be aware of. Why do we begin with par rates? Because this sets the risk-free rate. And when we look at the present value of almost any asset that has cash flows, we have cash flows in the numerator. This is the sum of I equals 1 uh, to infinity. We discount the cash flows at 1 plus the risk-free rate plus certain risk premiums are P, depending on how risky these cash flows are. But it is the beginning of the discount rate. So the higher these rates are, the higher the discount rate for your cash flows, the higher the discount rate, the lower the present value, which is why we see bonds have an inverse relationship with yield. If we see yields go up, we know bond prices are going down. It is a mathematical result. Uh, there is no uh, uh, other type of pricing in bonds because for fixed uh, coupon bonds, the cash flows are known. And since they are known, they can be discounted to the present, summed up, and we know exactly what the present value of all those future cash flows are. When we get to equities, the cash flows are uncertain. There's a certain amount of uncertainty associated with those cash flows. They're not fixed. So that's what makes pricing equities a little bit more tricky because we can all agree on the risk-free rate. We might disagree on what the proper risk premium is and we might disagree on the cash flows. So whenever you see an analyst say stock ABC uh, has a, a val fair value 100 bucks, somebody else will say no, it has 80 bucks. It's not because they disagree on the risk-free rate. They can all see the yield curve. It's because they disagree on the risk premium associated uh, with the discount rate, and they may disagree on the cash flows, one of two, those two things. So that's why we start with par rates, because that is the yield curve. And the shape of the yield curve um, has some meaning. And right now, we have inversions. So let's take the 2 to the 10. That is called a capital market inversion. Why? Because a 2-year bond is a capital market bond and a 10-year bond is a capital market bond. So that's called a capital market inversion. Uh, and what we do is we take the longer term bond, the 10-year, minus the 2-year. And right now we have 374 minus 4.5 gives us negative 7, 6. So this cell is just programmed. It is equals this cell minus this cell. So when I change these numbers uh, in this line here, uh, the spreadsheet just calculates the change. And then this over here just calculates the difference between this and this to tell me what change it was. And you can program the cell uh, to turn green if the value is above zero. You can program the cell to print red if it's below zero uh, and to print black if it equals zero. I haven't done that, I just do it myself, but you can program it to do that so that it takes care of that for you. So we have an inversion over here. These are all capital market slopes. 
And we can see other than the 10 to the 30, we have capital market inversions, the 2 to the 10, the 5 to the 10, and the 2 to the 20. These down here are capital market to money market slopes. So we have 5 and 10 year, those are capital market rates. The 3 month, which is over here, is a money market rate. Um, they mean something different when you get an inversion of a capital market to a money market rate. And we have inversions over here. So before every recession, before every recession, there has been a capital market inversion. However, not every capital market inversion leads to a recession. But every recession has been preceded by a capital market inversion. Every capital market to money market inversion has led to a recession. Now we have to be careful with the word led because we don't want to imply that it's the inversion that causes the recession. It's the inversion that changes the allocation of capital in the economy. It's the inversion that changes the behavior of market participants that then lead to an underinvestment in business uh, investment that then causes a lack of future growth that causes the recession if that continues on. It also tightens credit. And when you have a credit market problem, that is the only problem you have. Typically, if you have a high growth environment and you get a capital market inversion, it is signaling that the economy is about to enter a low growth environment. So you may have GDP running 4.5%, 4.6%. Something is going on. You get a capital market inversion. That's signaling that, uh, that GDP is going to drop maybe to 3.2, 2.5, 1.6, that you will decelerate from a high growth environment to a low growth environment. It is quite rare that you get a capital market to money market inversion in a high growth environment. You typically get it in a low growth environment. And that signals another downshift from low growth to negative growth. Because if you're in a low growth environment and the economy slows down, it typically turns negative. The growth rate typically turns negative. So capital market inversion with high GDP growth just signals lower growth ahead. But when you're in a low growth environment, as we have been through 2022, and you get a money market to capital market inversion, it signals an impending slower rate of growth. And if you're already at a slow rate of growth, that's why it tends to signal that you have a recession coming up. So that's why we start there. Then we look at uh, the slopes to see uh, what the shape of the slope is. Uh, and if it is inverted, it usually is a good signal that we have a recession coming. The inversions we can measure by D times D, duration times depth. And here's how it works. The longer, and this is a timeline, the longer the inversion and the deeper the inversion, the higher the probability of a recession. I know I'm writing all over the place on this screen, but can't help it. So we've had uh, the um, capital market curve inverted now for more than 200 days. We've had the money market to capital, uh, sorry, the capital market to money market curve inverted for more than 100 days. And both of them, uh, if they've been inverted for more than three months, have always preceded a recession. In other words, it becomes 100% probability based on what we've seen in the past. These are what are called empirical probabilities. Empirical meaning that you just look. You just look at the past and you say, well, how many times has it actually led to a recession? Every single time. That's why we say it has a 100% probability. But there's no mathematical formula that makes it 100%. It is just an empirical regularity. Empirical meaning we can observe that it actually happened in the past. So I think um, we're good on understanding what the par rates are and why we look at the slope of the curve. Uh, and I also write a few other things on this main screen when we look at it. In the top corner, I write the next date for the FOMC meeting. That is called the Federal Open Market Committee meeting. That is the meeting at which they set the overnight target range for the federal funds rate. That is not a traded rate that's determined by the market. It's set by the Fed. And then uh, the New York Fed is um, 
tasked with using open market operations to make sure that the rate stays within that target uh, by either borrowing at a certain rate or lending at a certain rate such that um, the borrowing or lending would not go outside that target range. And that target range, whatever rate the New York Fed uh, um, transacts at, the average of it all is called the effective federal funds rate. I'll show you where to get that shortly. So we want to know when the next meetings are because, well, they tend to move the market. The other thing we look at is the Fed balance sheet. And not the whole balance sheet. We really pay attention to the securities that the Fed bought under its quantitative easing program. Uh, the Fed is like any other business. Uh, if it had never engaged in quantitative easing, it would still have a balance sheet because to operate, it needs assets. So it would still have a balance sheet. So we don't look at the full Fed's balance sheet. We just look at that segment that's holding securities that were a result of quantitative easing because those are the securities that are running off. So we just monitor um, the uh, size of that holding just to see how it trickles off uh, each, uh, each week. And we want to be aware of it because it is pulling liquidity out of the system. Uh, and when it pulls liquidity out of the system, well then that money is no longer in the system that needs to find a home. And when money needs to find a home, it squeezes yield out of everywhere and forces other investors to go out on the risk curve and invest in riskier and riskier assets. Right now there is yield and fixed income, so that's giving a competition to other risky assets. We look at the reverse repo facility because it is elevated. This is the amount of cash in the banking system that is not being deployed anywhere else, that needs a home, so it's parking uh, at the uh, New York Fed because that's where uh, the reverse repos go. The Fed handles all of those. The uh, New York Fed handles all of that stuff. So uh, we look at the size of that. It's been elevated over $2 trillion for quite some time. Uh, as the Fed is running off its balance sheet, it is thought that it would reduce the pressure on the reverse repo market, that that funding would start to drop and drop. So far, uh, it hasn't. Um, what may be keeping it high as well is the high level of money market rates uh, uh, at the short end of the curve. Um, the Fed Watch. I'll show you the Fed Watch tool. This gives us what the market feels the probability of uh, the rate changes at the next FOMC meeting. So we can see how the market feels. You know, so we may have an opinion. Oh, the Fed will go 25 basis points. We can look at the Fed Watch tool and um, it will report to us or tell us based on trading and Fed funds futures what the implied probability of a specific rate hike is so we can see whether or not we're with the market consensus or against the market consensus or we can see whether or not the market is leaning predominantly one way or is it split. Um, then we also look at this. This is a forward rate. Uh, this is a three month rate 18 months from now. This is how we read it. When what? F when what? A forward rate when in 18 months for what? For a three month rate. Minus the current three month rate. So it is a forward money market yield minus the current money market yield. And it's a good proxy for where we think the effective federal funds rate will be at that time. If it is inverted, it is, there's an expectation, depending on the amount of the inversion, an expectation, especially if there is deeply inverted, an expectation that the Fed will have to cut rates because the economy slows too much. So it is also uh, a predictor of a recession, and it typically happens uh, in um, late slowdown periods when you are in a slow growth period. So let's have a look at some of the um, locations of which you can get the data that I'm talking about and all the sites I'm going to show you are free. That is the point of being a retail uh, investor is that we want to collect as much free information as possible. Uh, we don't want to have to pay for subscriptions. There are some subscriptions you can pay for that aggregate all of the information for you and you think this is great, look at all the information, but all they're doing is going to a whole bunch of free sites aggregating the information from the free sites and then charging you for just the aggregating of it. So if I can show you where all the sites are and you bookmark them in your, uh, in your browser, you can just, you know, on Saturday, click, 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 go from, from uh, bookmark to bookmark to bookmark, and you've got all the data yourself. So let's see what we have uh, there. And I'm just going to 
drag the, my uh, browser across the screen. Let's start with the Treasury. When you type in treasury.gov, as you can see up here, treasury.gov, this is the landing page you land at. If you hover over, actually you have to click on data, over here for interest rates, there's your daily treasury par yield curve rates. The other thing we use are the, uh, the treasury real long-term rates. So we'll, uh, we'll go to that shortly. Actually, sorry, the, the par real yield curve rates. We use the first two. But let's click on this and I'll show you how to use that. So here we are, it's 2022, we want 2023, and here's the, uh, we click on apply, and it changes all the uh, dates to 2023. We scroll down to the bottom, there is uh, February 13th, and we can see where all the rates have ended. What are the rates? Well, you kind of have to scroll up. If you want it to be uh, shorter, you can just click on current month, click on apply, and they'll all fit on the same screen. So you could just read right down, there's the one month, the two month, the three month and we can see in for February here the three month has hit a high and the same with the four month it has hit a high for the month so we can see that these rates are rising now if you were entering this into your spreadsheet every day uh, it would ought to be doing the calculation for you and you would see uh, each day which rates are hitting uh, new highs um, you can um, Download uh, 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 the comma separated uh, field for this. You can uh, uh, and import that into Excel for whatever uh, whatever time period you want. Notice that it goes back all the way to 1990, uh, and then you can, if you select all, it'll give you everything, and then you could just download into a comma separated file. And if you want to play around with a certain yield, like the 10-year yield for that period of time, you can. Although Fred uh, which is the uh, Federal Reserve Economic Database uh, from the uh, St. Louis Fed. Just ca type in all capital letters in Google, F-R-E-D. Uh, FRED has all of that stuff for you. So you can type in 10-year minus 2-year uh, FRED in Google, and it will give you that chart. So you don't actually have to do the work yourself. Um, the St. Louis Fed already has all that data and you could just go to Fred and it has an interface in which you can uh, choose whatever, whatever series that you want. So there's a lot of information there. Let's go over to the CME. This is the Fed Watch Tool. So if you Google Fed Watch Tool CME, you'll get the first link and this is what it looks like. Notice here across the top, these are all the central bank meetings left in 2023. Uh, and uh, this will tell you the target range, 475 to 5. Right now we're 4.5 to 4.75. So this is saying moving to 4.75 to 5, which is a 25 basis point increase, the market feels there's a 90.8% probability of that happening uh, and only a 9.2% probability of it being 50 basis points. And then at the very bottom, you can see what it is now, what it was one day ago, what it was one week ago, and what it was one month ago. So you can sort of see the progression of, uh, uh, of where the distribution uh, happened to be. Um, you can click on May to see the uh, distribution for May. Uh, this is uh, getting, this is uh, a 90.8% probability uh, that by the, uh, uh, sorry, that's the March uh, meeting, uh, sorry, oh, March, come on, uh, it's being a little slow in its, uh, in its reaction here, I think. Uh, okay, well, well, we got May, it's not clicking on March for some reason. So this is saying that, uh, uh, I think there's a, <laughs> I think there's a delay in, in what I'm clicking on here. You get what I'm doing, right? Okay, so this is saying that uh, by the May meeting, uh, we will have uh, an upper bound on the range of 5%, 20.2%, to 5.25% is 72.6% probability, and getting the 5.5, there's a weighting of 7.2% on that. And there's a bunch of other uh, sort of uh, uh, buttons that I would encourage you to click on and see what it has available for you. Let's go to the effective federal funds rate. You can just type that in, EFFR, NY Fed, and it will tell you. There it is right there. As of uh, February 10th, the effective federal funds rate was 4.58%. Um, the rate is published the next morning. So let's say it's February um, 
14th today. Uh, to know what the effective federal funds rate was, was for February 14th, we must check in on the morning of the 15th. It's calculated, uh, uh, it's presented the next day. And it gives you the first percentile, 25th. There's a whole range, and it just takes the, uh, the, uh, the median rate here, 4.58%. Reverse repo operations. Uh, this is it right here. Uh, we can see exactly uh, how much was submitted, how much was accepted, what the offering rate was. It was 4.55%. The operation date, Monday, February 13th. Uh, how many participating counterparties? 102. All 102 uh, were accepted as well. And it plots out uh, the, you know, all the way back to November here what the uh, daily uh, activity was in the reverse repo market. We can see that from uh, February 10th to the 13th that we increased from 2.04 trillion to 2.107 trillion so the demand for that uh, increased as well you can uh, break it down this is total security types you can break it down by Treasury agency or mortgage back uh, this is the system open market account holdings of domestic securities this is what the Fed how much the Fed has purchased in quantitative easing throughout all the years. That's the total amount that they still hold, 7.922 trillion. And they're allowing this balance sheet to run off uh, at the rate of 60, trillion, 60 billion in treasuries per month and 35 billion in mortgage-backed securities per month if that much matures every month. Uh, they are hitting the 60 billion mark on treasuries but not the 35 billion mark on uh, mortgage-backed securities because interest rates are very high. So with mortgage-backed securities, every payment you receive is principal and interest, along with prepayments. Well, when mortgage rates are high, no one is refinancing their mortgage, so prepayments slow down considerably. So your mortgage-backed securities, the duration of them extends. Uh, so it takes longer to get all your money back. Uh, as opposed to a shorter period because prepayments, as I said, decline as interest rates increase. Uh, you have a back button up here. If you click on previous, you'll get uh, the week before. So you can compare each week. We can see change from prior week. 30, uh, there was a drop of $38 billion. If you click back to January 25th, it had dropped $16 billion over that past week. Uh, another $20 billion drop over here. This is going backwards at January 18th. Another $1.2 billion. So from January 11th, to January 18th, the balance sheet decreased by 20 billion. From the 18th to the 25th, it decreased by another 16.2 billion. From the 25th to February 1st, decreased by another 38 billion. And uh, you can break it down. Uh, you can look at T-bills, for example. It gives you the maturity date of uh, the T-bills. It gives you a maturity date of uh, notes. So we know that they're going to uh, let uh, some of these roll off. We can see the next uh, uh, maturing amounts. Maturity date is February 15th. So on February 15th, you got 41, uh, 51, 60, you got $69 billion right here. $69 billion of uh, treasuries maturing. Uh, well, they're only going to allow $60 billion a month to run off. You got 69 maturing, so they'll let $60 billion run off and they'll reinvest the other nine. So they're still buying securities at a rate of whatever it happens to be less 60 billion. So if they have 100 billion maturing that month, they let 60 billion go, they buy 40 billion more. They roll that over so that the balance sheet does decrease by 60 billion in treasuries every month. So we can see when they're maturing. Then you have some maturing on the 28th. We've got another, what is that, 80 billion maturing at the uh, end of the month. So. Uh, this month alone, just with all the treasuries maturing, we can see uh, that they're probably going to be buying close to $100 billion worth of treasuries in February uh, in the open market, but letting $60 billion run off, but still having to buy roughly about another $100 billion. I haven't added it up, but uh, you can do the math yourself. And for agency, or sorry, let's go to MBS. We don't know. Uh, for MBS, it doesn't give us uh, a schedule simply because on a payment date, uh, every payment has principal and interest. Well, we don't know what the principal component will be because the principal part also includes prepayments. 
Well, we don't know what the prepayments are going to be, so it can't give you a particular schedule of what it's going to be. But every single, these are 30 years, and uh, if you scroll down, they should have some 15 years and then some others. Uh, every month, I think it's on the 20, 25th or 28th, I think the 25th, the, the um, Fannie and Freddie make all the payments on the MBS. So they get all of that in from all the bonds they hold on that date. So while treasuries have a maturity date where you get the principal back, uh, and then if it's not a maturity date, you just get nothing but coupon payments. Mortgage-backed securities on every payment date has a principal being returned to you. If that principal component is more than $35 billion, they'll buy more MBS. But they've already communicated that it will be below the $35 billion for quite some time because prepayments have slowed down. Um, finally, we can go to this site here, Chatham Financial. Uh, everything that you see on Chatham Financial, um, you can get at the CME, but you have to construct it yourself. What I like about F Chatham Financial is they basically taken all of the data from CME and built charts. You know, kind of, I don't have to do all the work. They've already done the work. So if I'm looking at the three-month rate, I could just hover uh, uh, on the chart. I can see right there, three months so far is 4.77. That's the current three-month secured overnight funding rate. Uh, that'll hug very closely to what the three-month um, T-bill rate is because the secured overnight funding rate is secured by um, T-bills. So if it's secured by T-bills, it is in essence a proxy for T-bills because it's just as risk-free as T-bills. So we can proxy the three-month rate 18 months from now minus the current three-month rate by using three months so far. So there is our three-month rate, 477. Notice it's for February 15, 23. So let's move to February of 2024 and then add six months to get to the 18-month rate. That would put us to August. The three-month rate there is 3.68. So we would take 3.68 minus 4.77. That would give us uh, 109 basis points negative. So we are inverted by 109 basis points. Again, that also has a 100% track record appreciating a recession. So this kind of gives you uh, the evolution. These are forward curves. If you look what I clicked on here, this is tools and technology. You have rates, forward curve cap calculators, defeasance calculators, yield maintenance, click on forward curves and you get this and then you could just click on whatever you want. LIBOR is ending at the end of June. There's no real uh, exciting reason for that. This is the Fed dot plot. So uh, you can see exactly where in the dot plot uh, um, the uh, Fed governors think that the, uh, that the rate will be. So you can see that the forward curve here is actually below where uh, the Fed thinks rates will be at that point in time. So they're still not really listening. The market still is not really listening or not really buying in to the Fed speak that rates will be at where they say it will be for that period of time. They're saying, well, maybe initially, but we think you're going to have to cut rates. And look at the, the way this drops down here into the end of 2024. And this is from July of this year into the end of 2024. Uh, there is some thinking that uh, over the next year to year and a half, or year to two years from where we are now, the Fed is going to have to lower rates because the economy will slow too much. I don't think the Fed is thinking that they're lowering rates anymore, or that the market is thinking that, oh, the Fed will lower rates as inflation comes down. They made it clear that they're not. So really, the only thing left uh, in those inversions is a fear of a recession, not uh, Fed cutting rates uh, just because inflation has gone away. And you can click on uh, anything here that you want. Uh, you can add the 10-year Treasury in there as well. Uh, and uh, this gives you uh, the forward curve. Okay, let's go on to real rates now. Okay, let's move on to uh, real rates, break-even rates, and the uh, Fed funds futures. And I'll describe to you what all of this means, and then we'll be done. So a real rate is a rate that you would get on a bond called a TIPS, T-I-P-S. That's a Treasury Inflation Protected Security. And if you take the nominal rate and you subtract the real rate, you will get what's called a break-even rate. 
So let's have a look at the five-year real yield. Uh, sorry, down here, 1.46 on the real yield. If you take the current five-year rate, which is 3.93, and you subtract 1.46, you will get to 2.47. That is considered a break-even inflation rate, meaning that over the next five-year period, if you think that inflation, average inflation over that period of time is going to be higher, you would buy a TIPS. You would buy a Treasury Inflation Protected Security. But if you thought that average inflation over the next five years would be lower than 2.47, you would buy a nominal bond. So let me walk you through two scenarios so you can see exactly how that works. Let's assume inflation comes in at 4%, uh, percent, and we're going to use the rate up here, 1.66%. We're going to use a real yield of 1.66%. Um, if inflation is 4%, what the TIPS does is it adjusts the principal amount. The principal amount will rise with the rate of inflation. So now, instead of $1,000 in the future that you'll get, you'll get 1040 there is the inflation protection, right? A treasury inflation protected security. You'll get 1,040 so that your future value is protected from inflation. In exchange for that, you'll get just a real yield. It'll always be 1.66%, but of a higher and higher and higher future value. So you'll make 1726 today. That'll be your coupon payment, but in the future, you'll receive 1,040. The belief here is that 1,040 will give you the same purchasing power in the future as $1,000 gave you today. It preserves the purchasing power of the assets while giving you a real return. Uh, let's look at what happens to the nominal bond. The nominal yield is 3.93%, so you would receive $39.30 today, but only $1,000 in the future. It would not increase. So 1726 today versus 3930, if you subtract the 1726 from the 3930, you got $22.04 more. You can reinvest that into your portfolio, buy more bonds so that the uh, total amount in your portfolio is now 12204. Still, the tips is 1040. It still beats you. Let's make inflation 2% instead. Remember, our break-even rate here is 2.47. So that means the principal would increase by 2%. It's 1,020 now. Still the same rate, the same real rate, 1.66%. You get 1693. However, the nominal bond still gets 3930. Let's subtract the 1693. The nominal uh, coupon paid $22.37 extra. If you reinvest that, your portfolio will now have 1,022.37 versus 1,020 for the TIPS bond. You do better uh, buying the nominal bond if you believe that average inflation over the next five years is lower than the break-even rate. So that is what we do with real rates and nominal rates. You subtract the real rate from the nominal rate. It gives you a break-even rate. Then you make an assessment. So for example, let's look at the 10-year. 2.33 is the current break-even rate. Do you think that inflation, on average, over the next 10 years will be higher or lower than 2.33? If you believe it'll be lower, you will buy a nominal treasury bond. If you believe it'll be higher, you will buy a real uh, uh, treasury bond. In other words, you'll buy a 10-year TIPS bond. So there we go with that. There are times where I quote forward rates. This is F11. I also sometimes uh, quote uh, F21, etc. So let's calculate F11. You can do it yourself. You don't have to look it up. Uh, what it is, is I'll draw out a two-year timeline. There it is right there. So we know that we have a two-year yield at 4.5%, and we have a four-year, uh, one-year yield at 4.89%. This rate in here is the rate that you would have to get such that if you invested $1 for this period of time, then reinvested that dollar for this period of time, it would be the same as investing one dollar for this period of time. So the forward rate makes the two investments equal. So if you take the bottom rate, the 4.5%, the longer rate, uh, and you invest money, you'll earn it for two years, so it'll compound 1.045 squared, divided by uh, 1.0489, uh, 
subtract out the one, you'll get the one year forward rate. So all we're doing is we're taking money and compounding it for two years and saying, well, we know it'll earn 489 for one year, whatever's left over, that is what it must earn for the second year, uh, such that we would be indifferent between uh, investing at one year for 4.89 and then rolling it over into a forward rate versus getting a two year rate today. F21, this is the one year rate two years from now. This is written as the forward, FUC is forward, and these two numbers are written as when what. When in two years, what? A one year rate. So this is 4.19, so 1.0419, and that is for three years, divided by, this is for two years, 1.045 squared, Subtract out the one and you will get the one year rate two years from now. That's all it is. Uh, and if you calculate the uh, one year rate one year from now and the one year rate two years from now, and you multiply out one plus the one year rate, multiply by one plus F11, multiplied by one plus F21, subtract out the one, you should get 4.19%. You should be indifferent between investing for three years and rolling over at the forward rates versus just investing today for the three years. That's how we get our forward rates. So it tells us something about uh, the expectation for where the uh, one year rate will be one year from now, two years from now, etc. If the market did not believe the forward curve, it would be trading in the nominal rates such that the forward rate would be where they think it where they thought it would be so at any point in time the one year forward rate represents what the market thinks the one year rate will be one year from now fed funds futures these are priced out as 100 minus r you need an index to price it out so it's 100 minus r r is the effective federal funds rate and we just subtract R. So look at August over here. We see this little dot. I'll show you where to get this chart in a second and it is at 9472. 100 minus R equals 9472. Right? Well it doesn't take much algebra to see that R equals uh, 100 minus 94.72 or 5.28. So what this is saying is that the market believes that the effective federal funds rate that we will witness in August if we go to the New York Fed and look at the federal funds rate for August will be 5.28%. That is greater than 5.25 but less than 0.5 so the market is thinking that the uh, Fed fund target rate will be somewhere between, well not somewhere, will be 5.25 to 5.5% by August. Right now we're at uh, 4.5 to 4.75 percent. Uh, so it is thinking here, this is suggesting 75 basis points, which is uh, three more hikes uh, uh, on the way up. Uh, and that's how we read that. That gives us some idea of where the market is thinking uh, central bank action is going to go to. Now, if you disagreed with that saying oh we're not going 75 basis points higher that's too much you would buy the index at 94.72 you would go long the august contract and this is zq you would go long the august contract there it is right there zq and the code is q3 on that one uh, and if they uh, only raise to 5%, like if they uh, went as high as, let's say, 5 to 5.25, the effective federal funds rate would be somewhere in the middle, let's say 5.15 instead of 5.28. This would rise to 94.85. And, uh, and that's it. That's how you interpret all of these numbers and what they mean. Let me, uh, before we go, let me just say a word about real uh, rates. As far as discounting cash flows, if we're looking at present values of uh, uncertain cash flows, not certain, but uncertain cash flows, which are equities, real rates matter more than nominal rates. The reason it matters more, and I'll clear some uh, uh, real estate at the bottom of the screen here so I can draw it out for you. Uh, that didn't work. Uh, what screen are we on to get rid of that? Everything here is in layers, right? There we are. We got it. 
So when we're looking at the present value of something, you have your cash flows. It's the sum from i equals 1 to n, however many years you want. You, can't, you have your cash flows in the numerator, and I'm just going to put 1 plus whatever your weighted average cost of capital is uh, in the denominator. Uh, well, these are uncertain cash flows, but one thing we know about these cash flows is we can say, well, they should grow at the rate of inflation. So if you're discounting with a nominal rate, well, your nominal rate will also grow at the rate of inflation. Uh, the question is, uh, once you remove inflation from your cash flows and you move uh, inflation from here, has the real discount rate increased or decreased? Because those two inflation rates should cancel each other out. So it is the real rate that matters more. So if we're forecasting cash flows for a company, it is often easier to forecast real cash flows. What does that mean? That means we'll start in year one and say, okay, well, uh, let's say, and, and let's say this is operating income, let's say it's gonna be 100 million. Uh, and rather than in the next year, try to figure out, well, what is the combination of price and quantity? Let's see, the company will raise prices maybe 3%, quantity up 4%. Rather than try to guess on where prices are going to go, we just assume constant prices and just say, let's increase quantity. Uh, they'll sell 5% more each year. So then they'll sell 105 and then they'll sell 110.25. And you can increase at 5% a year because quantity is increasing. These are called real cash flows. And you will discount it at 1 plus whatever the real rate is plus whatever risk premium you use for your equity. Uh, so it is the level of the real interest rate that has a much larger impact on the present value of cash flows than the nominal rate because in uncertain or risky cash flows, especially from equities, the cash flows can inflate at the rate of inflation as well. So you want to control for inflation in the numerator and the denominator. You can see that it is the real discount rate that will matter. So when we see real rates increasing, uh, we should be thinking about lower present values uh, for our cash flows unless you have some reason to believe that as real interest rates are increasing, that quantities sold in the future will increase by even more. Then you would have higher present values. But if you are in a slow growth environment, which uh, we are in right now, uh, uh, these uh, cash flows aren't going to increase at a very uh, fast rate because you're in a slow growth environment. Uh, if your real interest rates are increasing, your present values must be decreasing, and that is the present value, uh, you know, uh, as a whole uh, for the equity market. So we would expect to see lower valuations as real rates are increasing. The more bond-like the equity is, I know that sounds funny, right? Bond-like means you have an equity. Uh, that has cash flows that look like uh, coupon payments, that look like bond coupon payments. Real estate is very common for this because if you have a building, you pretty much know for the next year how much money you're going to collect because you know what your rents are. They're part of a lease. They're part of a contract. It's not as if rents fluctuate uh, every single month. You pretty much know what they are for the building. So the rents are like the coupon payments on a bond. So every month, whatever the building uh, earns in rent is very bond-like in that it is less uncertain than, let's say, what Apple would do or what GM would do. So REITs are very sensitive to changes in real rates. When real rates drop, REIT prices tend to go up. And when real rates go up, REIT prices tend to go down. But if we're looking at... Uh, nominal rates increasing, but the equity market is not selling off. It's probably because as the nominal rate is increasing, the inflation rate is increasing and real rates end up staying constant. And if real rates stay constant, the thinking is, well, inflation is increasing the cash flows in the numerator. Yes, it's increasing the weighted average cost of capital, but they cancel each other out. So there is no change in present value. It is the real rates that we want to pay attention to more. So that's why we look at real rates. We also look at inflation break-evens to see, well, are we going too high? And if we are going too high, the Fed is going to say, ah, 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 these expectations, because the break-even rates are expectations, they're going to say inflation expectations are becoming unanchored, and that would signal that this curve will go deeper. Well, let me see if I can write on that, that this curve will start going deeper, because if it goes deeper, that means the interest rate 
is rising. The Fed funds rate will rise. However, if we see these dropping, we would think that this curve will start to do this, which means the interest rate itself is dropping, not rising. And if that's the case, you probably see real rates starting to drop. And if real rates start to drop, then valuations uh, can start to increase. So hopefully this gives you a nice view of why we start with interest rates, why we start with the uh, shape of the yield curve. It tells us something about the type of economic environment that we're in uh, and why we spend time with real rates and break even rates and why we look at the Fed funds futures. They're all connected and they all matter uh, for the valuations of the assets that we're looking at. Hopefully that brings you up to speed so that on the next market outlook you could say, okay, I know what I'm looking at now. I know what it all means. Okay, let me just show you where to get uh, the real uh, rates from. Uh, I've shown you this. This is the uh, par yield curve rates. You drop down this menu over here and it's the second one from the bottom, the daily treasury par real yield curve rates. Click on that. Click on apply and there you go, the 5, the 7, the 10, the 20 and the 30. We scroll down and there is, as of February 13th, the latest reading on all the real yields. For the Fed Funds Futures curve, we'll go to the CME uh, and under Quick Strike Tools, if you drop this down, we are looking for STIR Analytics. There it is right there. STIR means Short Term Interest Rates. These are all uh, um, one month or three month rates, short term interest rates. Click on STIR Analytics, you'll get a chart that looks like this. It won't be on this, on this screen when you first get it. Uh, under Term Structure, click on Fed Funds Futures and you will get this chart and that's how you get to the Fed Funds Futures. If you are uh, on Google, just type in STIR Analytics CME. It'll give you a link, you'll link to it. It may request uh, well, it will. It will request that you log in. You need an account with the CME. They're free to open. Again, uh, I'm trying to give you everything you can get for free. There is a whole bunch of good stuff at the CME. If you are uh, not a subscriber, it's free to subscribe. Just open an account. Just open an account. But there is a whole bunch of interesting stuff uh, uh, that you can uh, that you can have uh, um, that's available here. This is a, a new thing that's shown up here: the Bitcoin historical pricing. Uh, but I do uh, make uh, reference to a lot of these different things at different points in time. So uh, you know, poke around, have a good time on this site. But a lot of good information on there that is useful. Um, so this is what the market outlook tries to do every week: is try tries to give you sources of data of which you do not have to pay for, or if you do have to subscribe to something, it's it's inexpensive, like 30 bucks a month, but it would have to have really great data. And I try to give you as much of that as possible because as a retail investor, we're certainly not gonna pay $1,200 or $1,500 a month just for data, especially when 80% of the data is stuff that we can get for free ourselves by just uh, having a list of sites that we can go to. That is it.